Welcome to episode 141 of the Scottish Liberty Podcast. Joining me today is the illustrious Jean Epstein, him of Soho Forum fame, probably more fame than he's ever seen his, in his life at the age of seven. What age are you now, um, uh, Jean? 54, 55? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm either 57 or 75, de depending how you group the digits. But right. probably, probably the second way of grouping the digits, seven, five, is, is more accurate. Yeah. Well, you know, we're both from Jewish backgrounds, and in Hebrew, you read the characters from right to left instead of left makes to right. Me, so let's me, say... I like that. It makes me 57. Yeah, yeah so let's say in Hebrew, you're 57. <laughs> well, most of you probably know that Jean kindly invited me to join the Soho Forum debate against Martin Ford on January the 6th. The YouTube video is approaching 10,000 hits. If you've not seen it yet, what are you doing with your life? Seriously? You've not seen the debate yet? <laughs> anyway, you can head on over there and watch it. You can pause the podcast and, and go and catch the debate first. Or you can, uh, yeah, no, indeed. Uh, What's going to happen, I, I'm taking over as host now, I guess. What's going to happen is that uh, we're going to do some Monday morning quarterbacking on, on that debate. And of course, I say Monday morning quarterbacking because some of it really is that I listen to it and some new things occur to me. I would have had criticism, I had criticism of, 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 um, of Anthony while it was happening, but now I'm going to pile on with even more about what he could have said from the Monday morning quarterbacking standpoint. So it's going to be a rough session for Anthony, but uh, he's tough and he's always eager to learn. That's and that's that. great. That's great about him. That's why one of the reasons I admire him. But in addition, uh, uh, we're going to make, we're going to try to not make this inside baseball and, uh, and speak uh, to those of you who may not have witnessed the debate, but I think you'll enjoy what's to come much more if you do as Anthony suggests and you watch the video or alternatively listen to the podcast. Uh, you can go on thesoulform.org and find the podcast or you can just go on an app, which you should be, which should be in your smartphone anyway, The Soho Forum Debates. The Soho Excellent. Forum Debates is on, is now an, a dedicated app which has all our debates and you can listen to it that way. So do that and then come back and listen to what's to come. Great, so Gene Epstein, uh, the great Gene Epstein is gonna give me some feedback on my debating technique because he was so far undefeated and so well, 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 debate. But wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, happened? Happened. what happened? What happened the other night, Gene? I lost. I lost. You lost. lost. You lost the debate. And then you have the audacity to come on my show and tell me what I'm doing wrong. Um, You're in, a winner. In a debate that I won by a huge margin. I'm kidding, of course. So we're all, so we're all going to learn. We're all going to learn a little bit about debating. Um, Gene, you've probably moderated more debates than just about anyone I know. And you've also participated in a bunch of them. So you know quite a bit about the debate technique. And so hopefully we're all going to learn. I, I, I'm, I'm five for six now. I, I, I wanted to have a, a perfect uh, winning streak, but I've done six so form debates, always taking the negative. And of course you took the negative in this case as well. And I won the first five. And, and I have to say that more than any other debate, uh, when this last one I had Tuesday evening uh, was coming to a close and the vote was going to happen, I thought this one I surely won. I did pick up uh, nearly 14 percentage points, but Steve Moore, the other side, picked up uh, nearly eight points more than I did. So wow. he won. And, uh, and so uh, I have to grant him that. And, uh, and, and it's cleansing for me to recognize mm. that uh, you can't win them all. And uh, it's, it's surprising to a largely libertarian audience and that also you have probably the correct position well i think yeah. you do that's um, right on that look debate how, look how badly i screwed up i i i i my sour grapes uh, i hope that uh, not a whole lot of people are going to disapprove of me for my sour grapes is that uh, as one one con one observer said steve moore had actually come from the white house that very day and it was the very day of president trump's 
a State of the Union address, and uh, President Trump was, of course, on the ropes because of the impeachment, and he's, he's an advisor to Trump, and he was defending his president. And uh, I think he more or less used the tactics of Donald Trump. And uh, that's what I think, and that I think there was a certain emotional swaying, stand up for your president, as some of them thought. I will say that that it was that 55% of the vote uh, was in my favor, was no, but of course I started with a low, little over 40%. So clearly the win went to Steve because he picked up more votes, but more than half voted, again, voted no. But however, again, in terms of swaying the crowd, which is the measure of the uh, before and after Oxford style debate, Steve did better by, uh, by a little, little over seven points. So that's what happened. And I recommend that it's going to be, uh, that everybody listen to that debate. And of course, judge for yourself. I believe the podcast is going to come out tomorrow and the video the following week. But getting back to you, I want to just fill in one little fact, which is that oddly and ironically, uh, Martin Ford, when he debated you uh, on January 6th, uh, cited the, uh, the universal basic income idea of Andrew Yang. And of course, uh, I didn't intervene at that point and just quip. And Andrew Yang was too chicken to debate. Of course, that's mm -hmm. improvised a little bit. But as you know, Anthony, you were supposed to uh, debate Andrew Yang in September of last year on this same subject. And, uh, and then uh, and we sold a lot of tickets. We actually were going to put it in a larger hall because uh, Andrew Yang is running for president. And he's certainly uh, a local celebrity. And that Oh, about uh, but then he suddenly pulled out. He said he would do it. We sold tickets and then he pulled out. And that was a big disappointment. So we had had to postpone it and get another opponent for you, uh, which turned out to be uh, Martin Ford. A very worthy opponent, by the way, I think. OK, Gene, could you just speak a little bit closer to the microphone, if oh, possible, sorry, sorry. or turn up the sensitivity of it as you sound a little bit quiet? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. back to me, my favorite person, my favorite topic of conversation. Well, the topic, the topic itself, but go ahead, yes. <laughs> the topic. Yes. Yeah. Um, you have some, do you want to talk about the topic of the debate first, or do you want to well, give... Well, well, yes. Well, let's, uh, look, let's not make it inside baseball. As, as you know, uh, it, it was that, uh, that robots, actually, can you read the specific... It was, I don't even have in front of me. It was we'll, the, um, automation and AI will soon lead to widespread joblessness and a concentration of wealth in the hands of the few. Yeah, underemployment. Well, actually, through an underemployment. And then soon, the word soon uh, was not supposed to be next year, but it was supposed to be within about 10 to 15 years. We clarified that for the audience. And, uh, and, and I think that overall, you earned your win. You did well. Um, and all we want to do is talk about how you could have done better uh, and, uh, by, uh, by focusing on what I regard as sort of the f I have to credit Martin Ford within a way evoking it in me because Martin Ford, who I think was very polite, uh, often made good points and, by the way, stole your thunder, so to speak, in terms of a debate by saying, let's acknowledge that the idea that wrote thing new, uh, that they've been saying it for a long time. Martin Ford went into some detail about how uh, Nobel Prize winners were saying it. So he was readily granting that we've been hearing this for many years, but this time is different. Uh, but then he said something else, which is that, uh, that even if I'm wrong, uh, economics has nothing to do with it. Ultimately, it's going to happen. Ultimately, it has to happen, and that and that uh, that the that whatever you can say about the economics of it is not going to be pertinent because the robots are going to learn with the eye-hand coordination and all the rest of it. They're going to learn uh, all that they need to do to replace human beings, and and I I think that uh, that you missed an opportunity to talk about something that I think you probably would have been well equipped to talk about, uh, which is, uh, I would begin by putting it this way. Um, robots can already replace acrobats, athletes. Actually, you did at one point, you talked about the, uh, what, the synthesizer, 
that could right. that you would think could replace all musicians. Uh, and but I would imagine actually you could tell me I would imagine that the synthesizer actually can't quite produce uh, the great music of a really accomplished music musician. No, no. And um, the the, my, the point that I made was when synthesizers were manufactured, musicians' unions went to the government to try and get them banned in case they replaced orchestras. Of yeah. course, synthesizers can't replace an orchestra. To some degree, to some degree. Uh, they, well, I mean, eventually, now that it's uh, maybe 70 years after their invention, they're getting to the stage where they do sometimes sound realistic. But most people... Well, my point is they can't, they don't produce the, the sound yeah. of a great pianist, right? They're not, they're not, a human being can produce a really accomplished pianist or musician generally can, can produce a, a better sound than a synthesizer can. Isn't that true? Yes. Well, I guess it depends what kind of music you want to listen to. But, well, if you're um, listening to Beethoven's Appassionata, if you're, if you're listening to really high, really accomplished classical music, just as an easy example, sure. I would assume that... Yeah. I, I'd assume that the synthesizers can't match Daniel Barenboim yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, but, but my, my point is a little bit different, and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, even, though, even though somebody might pounce on what I'm about to say, but this is it, that, that an easy example is chess. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, actually, I didn't do my research. I, I thought that it was true, still true, that while a machine, a computer can still build, be, beat in chess, uh, uh, the best grandmaster. If the best grandmaster is playing with a machine against just a machine, I think it's still true that the best grandmaster of the machine. In other words, a machine plus a grandmaster can be, beat another machine. Yes. So that people bring something to it. But but even so, what's also interesting, however, is that you think that people would lose lose interest in championship chess, like uh, uh, in terms of actually of tournament chess uh, because uh, because machines can beat us and yet uh, actually chess is flourishing more than ever before uh, the the purses are larger we still we still are very humanistically centered uh, uh, we still we, we don't want to see robots dancing on a stage we want human beings doing it we don't want to see the Olympic Games played by robots. The robots could do it far more gracefully. If you really designed them to go down a ski slope, they would look better, most likely. They could do things, and of course, my God, wouldn't it be a better idea? Because after all, then human, human beings are not injured in the mm. process of taking those risks. And yet, and yet we are very human-centered. And, uh, and, and the point I want to make more generally is that uh, is that what M Martin Ford, I think, so, like so many, because they're influenced by the, by the mainstream mathematical orientation to economics that thinks of it as a bad branch of physics, that they don't recognize the Austrian tradition that, that economic choices are fundamentally subjective, even on the cost side, they're fundamentally subjective, certainly on the consumer side they are, and that therefore, when you understand subjectivity, you'll recognize that there will almost probably almost always be a premium on a human being performing a service rather than a robot. And, uh, and, that, and I think that you should have, you might have been able to make that key point that, that ultimately, now it may be, now, similarly, of course, some of us, some of us poorer folk might, might employ uh, robots to help us with certain things. But the richer folk, you go to a nicer restaurant, you go on a cruise ship, you're getting a massage. I have a massage chair, but obviously people prefer human beings to do it. And the human touch and the human interaction, I think, could remain eternal. It certainly doesn't seem to change. We are human beings who want other human beings to help us. And, uh, and the very knowledge that this is not a human being is important. It's very, and actually I want to segue a little bit into Robert Nozick's idea of the experience machine, which I think is analogous. That, that say you could have an experience machine that could actually give you fully the experience of climbing Mount Everest. Or, or, or doing any other kind of adventure or visiting Hawaii gives you fully that experience, maybe even more vividly, would, would you really want to live in that synthetic world? I think it's analogous uh, because we definitely want to have the reality. We want to see the, ex of, of, of human beings caring for us, for example, not just doing exciting things, but doing the fundamental tasks of caring and interaction. So that's the reason why I, I believe that that is almost unlikely that robots 
will ever replace human labor. So that, that's, a, I think, a point you might have made, unless you're about to tell me you disagree with it. Uh, no, I, th I think that it's a valid point that I could have made. There's yeah. a few other valid points I could have made that well, didn't occur to me. Well, we point, can, well, you maybe want to tell me some of your list. Uh, I mean, you go for you go next. Go ahead. Well, I, I, nothing specific comes to okay. mind. I just know that when it came to my rebuttal during yes. the debate, I was quite weak. And the reason why I was quite weak is I was expecting Martin to give me more to play with than his rebuttal, which he didn't. No. So in hindsight, no. one of my greatest lessons from that debate was have some points prepared or just go back to the motion, go back to the resolution, which is what you advised me and what I would have done. Um, but the, the other thing is I did leave a few points out of my opening statement, which by the way, I, I've received a lot of praise for my opening statement from other libertarians. Uh -huh. But there was a few points I missed out of that because I didn't have time for them. And oh. I, I, I took them out in the writing of it. Uh, I would have saved them for my rebuttal, for my second crack at the whip. Knowing, so I that's one, one thing I absolutely learned from the debate. I can't remember the specifics at the moment, though. Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, I'll, I'll pick up on your point. I, I actually want to say a couple of things uh, uh, that my, I might have, one thing I might have said at the beginning is that, uh, as well, is that uh, when I started the Civil Forum, by the way, we've just had our 40th Oxford style debate at the Civil Forum. That was my debate. So uh, we've had a lot of debates. Uh, I've done six of them, uh, but uh, 34 of them were done by others. And I originally thought to make them learning experiences in which I would uh, write uh, commentary afterwards. Uh, my informal board of advisors told me that if you do that and if you make it candid in terms of actually criticizing the performers, then, uh, then it might rebound on you. Because walking into a solo forum debate is already a stressful in, uh, experience. Uh, and then if on top of that, the guy who runs it is gonna be criticizing your performance afterwards, then, then a lot of people might say, look, I'd, I'd just rather not do this, you know? And so I've been, I've been mostly muted in terms of my commentary to uh, debaters about how well they did. But then we get Anthony Samaroff, who heroically always wants to improve. And when I suggested I put him in the hot seat, he said, sure, let's do it. So I commend you on that, on your strength of character, Anthony. Uh, but, and I actually, oh yeah, my, my other comment is that I might have made that same mistake myself Tuesday night, Anthony. I felt, I found Steve Moore seemed to be agreeing with me so often, giving ground so often in the debate, I, I had the impression he was on the ropes. And mm. so I, I, Gave a sort of an easy, a slightly softball summary. <laughs> oh. That I, okay, I, sorry, we had a no, moment. Oh. No. Sorry. Yeah, okay, we're back. We're back. Okay, yeah, I don't know where you lost me. I, 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 let so me you said uh, it sounded like he was on the ropes. And oh, then... okay, well, okay, yeah. Well, I, I'll finish that thought. Yeah, I, I thought he was on the ropes and I, and I gave a, a sort of softball summary. I didn't, I didn't hammer at certain points. Uh, and uh, I probably got overconfident or I thought, I thought that uh, I wanted to be nicer to him, but that's just me. I want to go back to you uh, and I want to pick up on a key point, uh, which is uh, uh, expressed by Martin. How are we going to get uh, uh, truck drivers to take care of granny? Remember that one? Right. Uh, yeah. And that was, uh, his point was uh, that you can talk about how you'll create more jobs, but maybe you won't be creating jobs that certain people are suited for. And are you still there? Yeah, we're, we're yeah, done. Yeah, are you getting, here. hello? Hello, I'm still oh here. Oh my God. Uh, oh, okay, good. Yeah, okay. I'm still here. Okay, okay sorry, okay. Uh, the, 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 I think that, I think that 
probably one likely uh, tendency trend should be acknowledged, which is that uh, which is that something I recently read in uh, in Charles Murray's new book, by the way, Human Diversity, that that men uh, uh, disproportionately prefer working with things and women disproportionately. And uh, while there's a lot of overlap, uh, there's a definite bias. Uh, uh, as it's been put in about Sweden, for example, where are you, uh, you're jumping around, so I'm getting distracted. Yeah, I'm, gonna there? Try, okay. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to get closer to the router to see if that yeah. uh, spares us some internet problems. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I want to get back to my own uh, notes. All right. Uh, I, I was in the middle of saying then that, uh, that the idea, Martin Ford was essentially saying really that uh, truck drivers, they work with things. Right. And, and, um, and women, uh, women are better equipped to take care of, of uh, granny. And right. uh, while, uh, while certainly, bear in mind that Martin Ford was uh, judiciously saying that maybe one third of jobs go, are gonna be at risk. Not to not the other two thirds. Uh, he wasn't necessarily claiming that, but that all jobs would disappear. But ser but certainly, if one third of jobs are going to disappear, and you got a thirty a one third unemployment rate, that's that's worse than the Great Depression. So clearly, he was making a point quantitatively. And my and uh, what he was implying is that certainly there will be programmers and there will be people, the smart people who will still have jobs, smart men who will still have jobs, but the truck driver is not associated with somebody who has a high IQ, he drives a truck, and so what are you gonna train him for? Uh, that was his challenge, but you, you wanna say something before, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and this has come up quite a few times on comments on my YouTube videos on this issue. It misses the point to say that Jack the trucker is not gonna take it, care of granny. The yeah. point is because trucking's automated, goods and services are cheaper and therefore people have money left over to pay someone to look after granny yeah, yeah, yeah. and pay Jack to do something that he is suitable for. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. But Anthony, in all fairness, you basically made that point to Martin when you debated him, right. but you're still leaving that loose end, which I'm trying to address. Oh, thank you. I but didn't realize that. that you, left. You, you were pretty, forgive me, but when you said that, you're ducking the point. Okay, I mean, thank you. I mean, and also, I mean, by the way, I, 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 I do think that it was unnecessary for you to say that, well, you, you will have, you know, we'll, you will have people who need to man the unmanned uh, satellites. Yeah, I, I mean, he granted, of course, obviously, you do create jobs, but, but, I, but again, you, you have to basically grant that, that this will be a labor-saving technology revolution, labor-saving on net. And of course, that's much of the history, of course, of technology, it's labor saving. Labor saving is really the key to expanded productivity. You save on labor, and then you're able to, leave, uh, to, to, to use labor to do other productive things. So it's labor saving. In addition, uh, the truck driver then is, is a question. Now, I do think that, uh, that then that uh, there will be a general need for men to reorient themselves uh, to uh, to work with people rather than with things. I do think that uh, that we we can concede that the, the working with things uh, is something that the robots will tend to replace, like driving the truck. Whereas the working with people is what the robots won't be replacing. Which gets back to my earlier point that people will prefer another person, even if the robot is more efficient in tending to granny's needs, granny would prefer a, a human being doing it because we prefer human interaction. We wanna see people doing things, performing things and, uh, and, and acting on our behalf. And, and so, but my only point is that, uh, is that if we think of entertainment, we think of hospitality, there are plenty of things for, for truck drivers to do. And indeed, uh, 
the uh, if we have a situation in which uh, a a woman comes at a premium to take care of nanny, but a tra and a truck driver who can't be uh, billed as being as good as a woman to take care of nanny uh, comes at a discount, the truck driver might be hired. In addition, entrepreneurs will say to the truck driver, uh, "This these are the jobs available. They pay pretty well. They're pretty rewarding. Uh, we've got to show you how to do them." Uh, my point is that there are lots of men who do work with people, and and uh, and and the situation is not immutable. While men may have a preference to work with things rather than people, you and I may have lots of preferences uh, to, for the for, for what we do with our lives and how we want to work. But we can't always get uh, what we want. So, you know, we can we can get what we need. To echo that yeah. lyric. What we need is a job, and so my point is that uh, that even the truck driver, uh, if, if those are the good jobs available, can be told to work with nanny, work for granny. Uh, but of course, I did mention to uh, to Martin that if you think of a three-day weekend, and you and if you think of the huge expansion in hospitality and cruise ships, then then there will probably be things for truck drivers to do, like being servers and all the rest, because people like to be served by human beings. A truck driver could learn how to be a masseur. People prefer to take a massage from a sympathetic person. I think all of those things are possible. My, the only point I want to emphasize just to complete it is that, is that uh, when I was reading Charles Murray's new book on human diversity, and he's making that nicely put point, men prefer to work with things, women with people, um, he didn't close the door to the idea that men can learn uh, and, and reorient uh, to jobs that tend to emphasize working with people. Yeah. By, by the way, a little point, uh, Max Sklar of the Local Maximum podcast who came along to see the debate yeah. had me on his show while yeah. I was in New York. And yeah. he mentioned that he found out that the average age of truckers was actually quite high mm -hmm. and that most of them would be entering about the retirement age in the period that Martin, Ford, Yang and so forth expect the trucks to be automated. So a lot of these truckers will actually be reaching retirement age around the time that automated trucks will be available, apparently. So that was an interesting well, point. Well, that, well, that helps. That helps. Uh, but, I mean, certainly uh, Martin Ford could respond. That does help, but I'll tell you how Martin Ford could respond. He could say that, well, but, but their sons, you know, they, they, they clearly, they, they, the next generation uh, are a bunch of people cut from the same cloth as their dads, and, uh, and they, uh, they, they want to be truck drivers too. So uh, what are you going to do with those people who basically have the ability to work with the, the, as truck drivers. And again, although, as I say, more broadly than my point, the, the idea of men working with things that women, women uh, w will, f will choose, or, or as, as has been pointed out, I was gonna mention in Sweden, 10% uh, of the women are engineers and 10% of the men are nurses. Uh, and that, and then Sweden is regarded as the fa as the uh, as the non-sexist paradise where uh, where free choice is 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 totally uh, uh, encouraged, and yet you have this severe imbalance in the choices that people make. Uh, the men want to work, push around those abstractions and work with the things to be engineers, and the women want to work with the people. But ten percent of the men are nurses, uh, and so uh, and so I think that of necessity maybe more of them could become so. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but my point, but, but getting to the, the good part of that, what you just said, having to do with how of the phase in issue, the average age of truckers and all the rest of it, that obviously does make it easier, uh, as you say, because, because clearly the younger generation won't have the opportunity to be a trucker, but then they'll be ready for something else because they won't have gotten into that habit and that groove. So they'll be open to new opportunities. Uh, but this gets to something else I wanted to mention, uh, uh, which uh, I think would have been a primary issue. Uh, and. Uh, in a way, Tom Woods is laying it on you too. Uh, in the U.S. economy, for which we have good data, uh, right, uh, it's a, in the normal course of things. Every year, uh, 12 to 15 million jobs are destroyed, and uh, uh, right now it's a little less than 12 million because it's boom times. In slow times, it's more like 16 million. But it's it's nearly it's 10 to 11 million jobs being destroyed right now, even in a booming economy. And of course, jobs are added. 
jobs are added because if a million jobs are destroyed, 1.2 million jobs are created to create to, to replace those 1 million jobs destroyed. And so it's very clear that, that the US economy, even as hampered as it is by so many problems, so by the regulator, the, the, one of the major hamperings, I think, the, the, the high cost of housing in, in areas where jobs are plentiful and where jobs pay well, high cost of housing in New York and San Francisco, for example, because of, of the intervention of government that doesn't allow housing, new housing to be built. But even then, even so, even our, with our constricted labor market, uh, we have no great difficulty replacing 12 to 15 million jobs lost every year. Now, um, if, if Martin uh, went, then starts to talk about how this is going to be like electricity, that, that the robots are going to be everywhere, uh, then I think he's missing out on the normal course of how things are. Electricity had to be phased in, you know, the, and all technologies have to be phased in. It's a sheer fantasy to talk about how, uh, that, how, how the robots are going to take our jobs inside of a few months. You know, the, the uh, manufacturing them, uh, experimenting with them, developing them. Some businesses will be doing it. Others will be latching on it. It's going to be a slow deve developmental process. However, however, if uh, you and I, as you said, we, we're not here to predict the future. The other side really has the burden of predicting the future. But, but, but if we want to grant for the sake of the discussion that, that not 12 to 15 million jobs are going to be destroyed in a year, but 50 million jobs destroyed in a year, then I guess we have to agree that, that, that the U.S. economy is probably not ready for that abrupt transition. But, but again, most realistically, if it's 12 to 15 million jobs destroyed every year, maybe 16 to 17 to 18 million will be destroyed of some acceleration. But clearly, uh, it's, it, 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 in the normal course of events, it's always a phase in process. The vast, the, the vast number of people who left the farm, 60, 70% of the, of the labor force on the farm, now one to 2%, that happened over decades. And, uh, and, and certainly the new, the, the driverless vehicles or the autonomous vehicles as they're called, uh, it's all, and human beings have got to get used to things, experiment with them, it's all a phase in process most realistically and uh, and and therefore uh, this uh, metaphor that uh, that he wants to throw out it's going to be like electricity is everywhere is extremely unrealistic but, however uh, uh, as with anything if if a if an abrupt shock happens to the US economy as i like to point out to people could there be a consumer-led recession yeah i guess certainly in the food industry if we all went kosher tomorrow and then, then all the pork chops, all the non-kosher food would, would, be un, would not be sold and there'd be vast amount of immediate shocking layoffs uh, in the economy. But consumer spending changes in predictable ways and, only, and, and changes only, uh, in only, uh, uh, only gradually. Uh, the real shock to the economy really comes from the Austrian business cycle having to do with malinvestment where suddenly a lot of, a lot of capital investment is not viable. That is a shock that can really hurt the economy. Uh, but, but labor market changes, demographic changes uh, happen slowly. Technological changes happen slowly and they're not shocks. That's my key point, which you might have been able to point out uh, during the debate. Anything you wanted to say? I have, I have some other notes, which I was gonna go on to. No, I'm enjoying getting an alternative Good. angle and hearing more from you. So let's just okay. keep All right. going. I, I, I thought that this is a small point, but but I, I thought that, uh, that 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 it was a strange amount of celebrity worship that Martin Ford was expressing because I'm laughing a little bit because it's just a little bit silly where twice or maybe three times he talked about Jeff Bezos prediction. The great Jeff, Be Jeff Bezos is making a prediction. And, and the last time he cited it, I was standing there, I have to say that I thought, you know, Anthony should pounce on this. He's citing it as though it's a given fact. Jeff Bezos has predicted that, that the eye-hand coordination problem uh, of robots is gonna be solved in 10 years. 
And then he said, well, so dealing with those facts, I said, what fact? I mean, you know, in other words, the, the, the guy is the richest man in the world, and therefore any prediction he makes has got now to be treated like fact, you know? I was just dis too distracted by the conception of what people might get this uh, hand that matches human dexterity to do for themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh, I see. So, you, so you, your, your smutty mind w was unfortunately blocking you. I'm kidding, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah the, they, well, I mean, certainly I, we assume, it, you know, again, I, I only meant that, that what's amazing that, that we, we go around talking about how some celebrity, so, some, some guy who's made a fortune of money has made a prediction, and therefore uh, we all have to assume it's as good as done. And uh, that's going to happen in 10 years, you know, and uh, um, obviously uh, you would have been able to say, look, you know, it, this, 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 this is the problem with certain futurists. Uh, their, 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 their predictions now become sort of a booyah base, an amalgamation of, of different sort of ill-digested thoughts. And, and, they, and then now, the, now next we'll hear, I guess, what Warren Buffett is predicting for technology over the next 10 years, because Jeff Bezos is not a programmer. He's not, he's, he's just somebody who, who's had great ideas about distribution and all the rest of it, but, but he's no technological genius and doesn't even bit, uh, bill himself as such. He's an entrepreneurial genius, not, not anything else. And, uh, and so, uh, and, and Bill Gates said bad predictions too. So it gets a little silly, Murray Rothbard. So anyway, that was silly, but, but, uh, but again, it gets back to the idea that even if robots begin to be better and better at, 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 at doing things, they're already better at so many things at playing chess and, and the rest of it, and even doing a massage we want human beings to do those things, but uh, gets into my next point, uh, which is a, a debate actually that Brian Kaplan had with Robin Hansen, uh, which was an earlier uh, uh, cell phone debate. And uh, Robin Hansen, uh, who's written about what's called M's, what's he called the emulators, that they will be they will be robots who will, who will be taken from brain scans. Of, of, of Anthony Samaroff and Gene Epstein, for example. And so you will have supposedly an emulation that will be a, a, a diff, a, just another Anthony Samaroff. That, this was Robin Hansen's idea. Uh, but Robin, Robin at least grants that this is a, this is a, a hundred years away, at least. <laughs> it's, not, it's not imminent. And, uh, and by the way, Robin Hansen was very good at, uh, at reducing Charles Murray uh, down to size, because Charles Murray was arguing at, at another debate, uh, Charles Murray was arguing that this time is different and the robots are taking our jobs. One of Charles Murray's problems, even though he's a brilliant guy in other ways, but Robin Hansen was saying that, that, uh, that uh, something else that's come up that came up as a question, uh, if you recall, uh, uh, having to do with productivity. You know, it, it, he, uh, Martin was asked from the floor, how come the official productivity numbers are, are no great shakes? Uh, if, if the robots are about to take our jobs, shouldn't we be seeing it in, in the productivity numbers? Uh, and in, I could elaborate, and indeed we should be uh, seeing it. And that was the point that Robin Hansen made. Uh, well, no, nothing much has been happening. We're not seeing anything dramatic in productivity numbers. However, you dice them and slice them. And, and Martin fell back on some crazy statement about how, well, for a long time they were selling, saying about that, about computers, and then there was some acceleration in productivity. Uh, of course, you could have pounced and say, Martin, you're saying this is 10 to 12 to 15 years away, and we're not seeing it in the productivity numbers. So, uh, so, so you should it should at least give you pause. You know, now you're, you know, we, you, we, sometimes you say we're starting to see it because then he was talking about those prime age men, but, but we're not even starting to see it. We actually, we actually see rather relatively uh, uh, uninspiring increases in measured productivity. Uh, you, you might have said that, but getting back to the Robin Hanson and Brian Kaplan debate, um, even with respect to the more difficult issue of the M's. Brian uh, had a particular point, really his key point was this, that, uh, that, that when, we, when we domesticated animals, it was taken for granted that, that those animals are going to be trained to serve us. We're not going to want any animals. If an animal attacks us at the throat, you know, that's not the kind of animal we want to raise. We want to raise them docile and cooperative. 
And so, and so we are a human-centered race. So he was saying, even in terms of those M's that are rep going to replicate, which, what businessman is going to want to hire a bunch of M's who, who are going to rebel against them and not take orders and take over the company? You know, the point is that they, that that robots that that nobody's going to want to buy these. They're all going to be designed to serve us, uh, and uh, they're not going to be designed to conquer us. Uh, just like we could, we, we obviously we're the we're the weakest animal for our size on the face of the earth. Uh, uh, Robin Hanson might have been predicting that that if we start using uh, you know uh, dogs who could easily cut us up the throat, we could easily be killed by them all. Well, that's not the way we planned it. That's not what we did. Or the horses could be trampling us all. Uh, so we we designed them to learn how to uh, how to help us and how to take orders from us, not how to do anything else. And so, uh, what was my point there? <laughs> I guess my point my point there was part of the difficulty of robots actually replacing us. Maybe it's not such a good point. What's your reaction there? <laughs> yeah, I think that it's quite weak because yeah. um, animals are by de what, less intelligent than us yeah. whereas well, there's nothing to say that that ai's will forever be more int less intelligent than us 50 years 100 years 200 years 300 years given an infinite amount of well, they're time. already more i say well okay and before so again they're already more intelligent they can already be, beat us at go and beat us mm -hmm. at chess as they had intellectually demanding mm -hmm. games they can beat us, so they are already more intelligent. But, but again, I, I guess, I guess it, I guess it has to do with, uh, uh, with a claim. I, now that I'm thinking about it, it was really a claim that Robin was making uh, that they might conquer us, right. that they might start killing us. And I guess that's not quite relevant to the debate you had, or even the larger question that uh, that uh, that Tom Woods raised with you uh, about. Uh, the idea that we're going to raise robots that are, that are going to be so much smarter, they're going to turn on us. Uh, it's just unlikely that we're going to design them that way. Well, weak point. Uh, let me go back to, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, okay. There's that other bit where uh, uh, you did, uh, when, 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 when uh, Martin uh, tried to talk about, well, it's in the here and now, because prime age men have dropped out of the labor force, uh, then uh, prime age men being men between the age of 25 to 54, as he elaborated, he knew his points, he said, well, they're, they're a little bit too old for school because they're 25 and too young to retire. So indeed, it's been, a, uh, it, it's been uh, the focus of interest, uh, the prime age men, uh, but, uh, and, and, uh, and there has been a decline in labor force participation by prime age men, and Martin tried to cite this as an indication that the robots were already taking our jobs. And what's your answer to that? Um, well, I, well, you put me in the spot. What should my answer to that be? Let's put it Well, you way. had an answer you gave, John, because I gave it to you. Remember when we discussed this afterwards? Uh, the, 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 the fact is that, 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 the prime, that the decline in the labor force participation of prime age men oh, yeah. started, started in the 1960s. And, and it was already a focus of Charles Murray's book, Losing Ground, right. in 1981. And, uh, and, and, and it's very clearly documented. Uh, and, and of course, it's it's been the source of concern because you'd expect that the prime age men should be having a ninety five percent labor force participation rate. Mm. Uh, generally, that's what men do; they tend to take the jobs. How come it's now? It's it's now now it's eighty nine eighty nine percent. It's it, it's ticked up. It was down to eighty eight percent. So so it's definitely fallen a number of percentage points. But but uh, as Charles Murray uh, noted, however, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's an indication of uh, of the decline of, of our culture, uh, and and it gets back in a way to what Martin Ford was saying about men uh, taking care of granny. The, the re you you read time and again uh, that that when people talk about prime age men not being in the labor force, they literally say that, well, they couldn't find jobs that they wanted. That's, that, uh, that's probably not even true, but, 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 but let's take that statement at face value. They couldn't take a job, they, they couldn't find a job that they wanted, let's say, in construction or in manufacturing, and therefore they dropped out of the labor force. You know, it was Charles Murray who said, we used to call such men bums. 
Right. You know, we, we, never, we never had this idea that if, that if you can't take a job, that the kind of job you want, that you have a right to simply not work. You know, if there yeah. aren't jobs available, then just take the job you can get. That's what our philosophy used to be. But, but, but to this day, you find that statement being made over and over yeah. again. And Martin Ford might even have been taking, well, yeah. the trucker doesn't want to help to help take care of Nanny. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Well, this is something that my brother came up with when I did a um, podcast called 1001 Misgivings. Yeah. Uh, a very good podcast it was too, in my opinion, oh, wow. where I uh, took on some objections to my views. Mm -hmm. And my brother said this kind of thing about, well, Jack the Trucker is a free spirit, you know. He's not necessarily going to be happy looking after Granny or this, that, and the other. And I said, well, you know, at the end of the day, a job is what you do for other people. You know, uh, fundamentally, if you're lucky, you have a job that you really love. But um, the fact is you're being paid to meet the needs of other people. It's not all about you when you take a job. Now, once you've got the stability of that job, if you don't love it, at least you've got money coming in, then you're, you're gonna have some security from which you can plan your life and decide what kind of profession you want well, to go well, into from there. Okay. Okay, very well said. That's good. However, I will. I the first point I would stress is that 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 if a job is available for you uh, that you can get, uh, then uh, then if you uh, if you want to be a beggar in the streets and uh, beg off people, then that is a kind of job too. But the one thing you do not have a right to do is to tell others you've got to work to support me. Right. Because I want to be a bum because I don't want to take a productive job that's being offered because it's not to my liking. That is an immoral, unethical act that, that progressives keep endorsing. Right. Uh, well, they didn't like the jobs available to them, and so now they're, uh, they're on the dole. They're on, uh, they're on disability. Uh, that is a statement. My, my, grandfather, uh, my grandfather lost his job as a waiter during the Great Depression, and uh, I asked my mother, well, then what did he do? And she shrugged it. He said, well, he got a job as a dishwasher right. for the rest of the Depression. He had a wife and four kids to support. Mm. And, and his immigrant wife, who was also from Eastern Europe, was not about to get a job in the 1930s. And so he supported his family as a dishwasher. You can't work as a waiter. You work as a dishwasher. And then uh, when World War II started and the economy heated up and the demand heated up, he went back to, to, uh, to, uh, to becoming a waiter. And so that's that's what people with dignity do, right? Uh, and uh, and the idea that we have this attitude, you can live off yeah. other people. It's definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that it's kind of promoted, or at least um, the atmosphere that I kind of imbibed growing up was that, oh, uh, you know, a, uh, all the stuff like a jobs uh, never known. I don't know how to put this, but basically that like the, if you were working a job that you that it wasn't going to be your final career, that you were somehow wasting your time or things like that, whereas actually you learn skills and you, you gain an income from doing that. I just think that the culture, there's a bad cultural attitude. I think that's what you're saying towards work compared to the one that there used to be. The idea, the idea that you can just not take a job because you, you don't find one that you like, it's so recent because we've only been so wealthy and we've only had a welfare state that supports it so recently. And we only have a welfare that state that supports it so recently because we only had the wealth where people wouldn't object to be, being taxed for it recently. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, you know, see if you were a coal miner in the 30s or whatever, like, you, 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 won't want, you probably don't want to do a job that shortens your life and fills your lungs full of black coal dust. But you did it because you had to do it. And people widely acknowledged that. They went out and did jobs that they didn't necessarily like because they had to create wealth to support themselves and their families. I think that's the, the fundamental point you're making. But I fear I digress. Okay. But, and I'm sure you've got some more points to yeah. make. And okay. since yeah. we've not got an infinite amount of time. Okay. Well, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm, maybe we're going too close. I, 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 the, the, the larger, the only remaining larger topic uh, that I wanted to mention is, 
uh, is something that uh, that Tom Woods went into when he spoke with you, because uh, it was a big issue for him. Uh, but we are clearly, I think you could have said more at the debate having to do with price deflation. Uh, yes. and oh yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because I meant to ask notes, you about it. Uh, I, I think you could write an essay called Hungry, Naked, Homeless. Why would, it, why would the essay be called Hungry, Naked, Homeless? Because when Martin Ford said, look, if prices are falling, uh, the big problem with it is prices are falling, people just don't buy. Mm -hmm. uh, because they expect prices to fall further tomorrow, so they're not gonna buy, and then tomorrow, they're gonna expect prices to fall again the next day, and they're still not gonna buy. And so, of course, you could have said uh, during the debate, I guess we're all gonna remain hungry, naked, and homeless, because tomorrow, the food's gonna be cheaper, so we don't wanna buy it now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the clothes is going to be cheaper, so we'll go naked. And the homes are going to be cheaper, so we might as well sleep out on the streets. Uh, that's what Martin Ford is suggesting we're going to do, uh, because we're not going to buy. Because when 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 uh, when I said to when when I as moderator was only able to nudge him, and I think as you said to to Tom, uh, I crossed the line a little bit because I was a little bit impatient with this crazy statement. I'm trying to turn the line on here. Uh, it, where he said that. Uh, that, that indeed, that when prices are falling, uh, people are not going to buy. So I said, is that true of computers? You find they're not buying computers in the ones. Well, uh, people buy just a new computer every year, but when all prices are falling, then uh, that's what he said. He, he, I listened to it again. Yeah, he said, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it might be okay with computers, but if everything, the price of everything would fall. They only buy, no, he said they only buy a computer every year. That's what right. he no, I listened to it recently. Okay. I, Okay. Yeah. Well, well, it's the same thing. Yeah. No, no, so, thing. so, Gene, just for those who of us who could use an economic yeah, yeah, education, yeah. can you explain why um, deflation would be a good thing, and also why his claim that this is going to put people in debts that they can't pay back anymore, yeah. uh, those those points are flawed. Well, well, first of all. First of all, again, if, if uh, I, I guess the first distinction to be drawn is that is that we probably have not had uh, a sustained period where not just prices were falling, because actually you did you I, mean, I can't fault you entirely. Uh, you did make the point uh, at the debate that in the late uh, 1800s uh, in the U.S. late 19th century prices were falling and, the, and there was uh, substantial economic progress. You made that point. Uh, but uh, I don't believe that it's true that wages were falling. Basically, uh, wages were about stable and prices were falling. So if you, have, so if you paid the same amount uh, year after year, but things continue to get like 3% cheaper each year, then that amounts to a 3% raise. Uh, that's true. Uh, but uh, and and uh, and, and pro very possibly, if we have if we if we if we have a Federal Reserve that doesn't go away because we were not assuming that that the monetary expansion of the Federal Reserve will go away. Very possibly, we will have that kind of regime where most prices will be falling, but wages will remain stable. Uh, but uh, but by the way when it came, since we're, we're discussing this, when it came to a, dis, a debate about Bitcoin, where Bitcoin will never exceed 21 million units, then not only prices will be falling, but wages will be falling. Because, uh, because if you double the labor force, uh, then clearly twice as many people working uh, against a stable 21 million units of, lay, of, of, of money uh, is going to mean people are earning half as much. People are earning half as much However, prices are down by 90%. Uh, so if you're earning half as much and prices are down by 90%, you're far richer. Uh, and uh, I will mention to you that George Selgin, uh, an economist at the, uh, at, at the Cato Institute, believes that it's going to be very destabilizing if wages fall. I think he's wrong. And, and even his colleague, Larry White, thinks he's wrong. Wages and prices can fall. Uh, we can live in that regime. We're just not used to it. People can get used to such things and understand the realities. So in just in sheer arithmetic, uh, the, uh, bear in mind that you were the one who emphasized, by the way, that we want to talk about price deflation or price inflation. Always use the word price in front of that number. I always do that, yeah. Word. Of the in front of that word, I mean, because because when we use the word, uh, the mainstream uh, and and in common parlance, they use the word deflation, uh, not realizing that they're describing two different 
phenomenon. That's to, right. To, the inflation of the money supply yeah, yeah, and yeah. the increase in prices. Well, and I, al price, I yeah. always say price inflation yes. reflexively for that exact price reason. Or, or price, exactly. I do. And then you actually, you were the one who emphasized that if you're going to talk about the reverse, say price deflation. It's not exactly a cumbersome and awkward phrase because mm -hmm. The, the fact is, though, that, that, that and of course, Martin, uh, not knowing those distinctions either, and never, George Selgin likes to say, well, there's good deflation and there's bad deflation. That's the way he put it. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, the, and the bad deflation is when the money supply is contracting. And, and, and that, and a, and a contraction in the money supply, uh, which does happen under fiat currency, did happen during the Great Depression, uh, uh, is very, very unlikely to happen uh, under, under a Bitcoin regime or even right. the most gold regime. So therefore, therefore the, the, the point to be made is that, is that we can go into why a, an outright monetary contraction could be wrenching, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about price deflation. And that's, that's a much more simple uh, issue to resolve. Not a contraction of the money supply, but where prices are falling and very possibly wages are falling, but prices are falling uh, by orders of magnitude faster than the fall in wages. And then it's just a matter of arithmetic to recognize that people are getting richer. And you at least commendably made the point that historically prices did fall fairly steadily uh, in the uh, in the, in the late 1800s, but there was no disruption. Did you want to say something? I, yeah, I just said, what about the proposition yeah. that Martin Ford made that people's debts would become oh, worth yeah. more oh, in yeah. real terms, would become cost more in, in real terms, and that would cause a disaster? Well, well, actually, uh, you made a good point afterwards, and not at the debate, though, and, and, and then I actually briefly asked him, well, what if it happens gradually? The point is that, again, that really, most realistically, uh, even if we're going to assume this extreme uh, uh, and rapid increase in output and hence in productivity because of robots, it, it's not, it, it's going to be a phase in process. And so we'll begin to see falling prices and then new loans are going to be negotiated on that basis. Uh, and, uh, and so it probably won't even be very wrenching for most loans, uh, because because again, it's, it, it, I, what, what Martin doesn't realize is that he is constantly conjuring up the idea of something happening within like a 24 month period, and 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 to any large economy, again, if 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 uh, if, if, if consumers all all went uh, vegan uh, in, a, in a few months, it would be very wrenching to the food industry. It could easily cause a recession. Uh, there'd be some such massive layoffs. Uh, because because like eight and eighty percent of what's being produced is no longer going to be going to be sold. So we could conjure up all these crazy shock fantasies, but it's not what usually happens. And so uh, that's the whole point about uh, uh, about loans and, and about the about the slow tendency for prices to fall and for loans to be negotiated on the basis for real estate values to settle. However, you were the one who made a very good point, which. I take it, I don't need to remind you of. You've made that point. Oh, yeah. I, I, I just said yeah. that for, for our listeners' benefits, that the banks aren't just going to let everyone default on their mortgages at once because then they'll have to sell those houses at knockdown rates. Yeah. They'll, they'll have to sell them at a loss once yeah. they reacquisition them. It would be much more profitable for them to go to the homeowners and say, right, okay, obviously the value of your loans has gone up in real terms but the price of money has, has, not, uh, has gone down. So, or up, I can't sure. remember. <laughs> so we, we'll, we'll meet you somewhere in the middle, you know, somewhere that's affordable for you to pay back rather than go through the hassle of having to reacquisition everyone's houses and then put them up for auction, which no yes. one, neither party would stand to look, gain from. Yes. Let, let me put a fine point on what you say. Uh, so you have, a, you have a half a million dollar home and you're paying certain interest on it. And, uh, and then wages are going down, prices are falling even faster. And, uh, and, and the value of the home is falling. And so what do you do? Well, the, the key point to bear in mind is that, is that with those rapidly falling prices, uh, say, to use an easy example, uh, a, a quarter of a million now buys what a half a million was buying. 
And so therefore, you have huge room to renegotiate the mortgage down to a half, quarter of a million for the bank. And as you indicate, uh, the bank, uh, the vast majority of creditors will prefer that outcome rather than to repossession or all the rest of it, because they'll recognize that even if you discount it down to a half, quarter of a million, the, 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 the lender will still be whole. The creditor will still be whole because that quarter of a million, because of those forming prices, is worth about as much. So, therefore, the transition period might be a little bit messy, but it's not going to bring catastrophe. And even that, even that posits an idea that all of this happens very quickly rather than on a phase in basis. And so, therefore, that's really not a problem. But, and then, but then to also raise another question that is, is often in people's minds, I, mean, I was even asked this by sophisticated people. Uh, um, if, if prices are constantly falling, uh, I mean, obviously at different rates, but if, uh, if, if almost all prices are, are falling by 3% or more, how do businessmen even plan for the future? How do they do business? You, you, you're, you're, you're planning to manufacture something and turn out a product in a year. Uh, you're investing for, for a, a year or two out. And you know that the price of what you're going to be selling is going to be three to six percent lower in a year or two. Or two. So, so how are people going to borrow? What's going to happen? And the obvious answer to that is that businesses work on the spreads. They buy factors of production, labor and capital, um, um, with the expectation of what they can sell the stuff for when it's going to be uh, offered to the market. And so therefore, labor and capital will be bought at a discount. And you will therefore still have positive interest rates because interest rates are always will be the spread between what the businessman uh, is, is paying for his factors of production and what he expects to sell them for two or three years from now. He'll have some productivity increases. Uh, obviously, businessmen are going to make wrong calculations, as they always do, uh, but for most businessmen will understand that obvious point. They buy, they, they buy factors of production in accordance with what they think they can sell the good for. And so that's the way they will plan. It is, by the way, interesting to, to talk about and to posit what would happen to real estate. What would you pay for a home if you know that, that basically homes are declining in value. Homes probably will not be declining in value because it gets back to my, to my factors of production point. A, a home will be purchased at a price, once, it's once, once expectations settle and are in place, a home will be purchased at a price that will reflect the fact uh, that that there's such vast productivity that new homes could be built quickly, and that and that and that you don't want the home to to, uh, to decline in value. So the present day price of homes will probably be considerably lower to reflect that expectation about the future price of the home. If you follow what I'm saying, uh, that that there will be a very different kind of real estate market, but. But again, not you know, not that difficult to explain to or to think through. Not that difficult for a business to say we're we're getting a certain amount of revenue. We're going to have to we're going to have to lower wages by twenty percent uh, in in a year uh, or ten percent in a year to to to, be, to reflect that. Uh, but bear in mind that prices are now fifty percent lower, so you're doing much better. It's not difficult for people to understand. And what are you going to get? Universal strikes. People are going to understand this is the way of the world and they're going to sit back and like it because because prosperity is going to be so uh, commonly enjoyed by all okay. well gene yeah. with a knockout the park like that i think it's time to wrap up this episode of scottish well, liberty podcast well, again, again kudos to you first of all you did a good job at the soul forum debate and and you asked the kind of question that few ask, more should ask, but Anthony Samaroff always asks, how can I do better? And that's why you invited me on the show. And I, and, and I salute you for that. Well, it's very, it's a great pleasure to have you on the show at last. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm uh, glad to add, glad, glad to have you. And uh, I always look forward to your appearances on other people's show. So it's okay. nice to have you on my own show. Well, and, 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 and you might want to watch uh, the, my, my debate uh, with, uh, with Steve Moore. I think it will be released tomorrow, or at least within a few days. Uh, and uh, I'd be curious to get your Monday morning quarterbacking. Right. How did Epstein screw this one up? How did Gene Epstein lose? Say it ain't so. Five for five, and now he loses? 
appalling. So you might want to comment on that. Right. Well, speak. someone always has to lose a debate. And, but did uh, it have to be me? I was five for five. But anyway. Have a great day, Gene. Thanks so much for joining me. Bye-bye.